Throughout the years, filmmaking kit has become more and more democratized. There have been several steps throughout the progression of digital imaging technology, and we have now reached a point where cameras that you and I can pick up somewhat affordably are now being used by not only episodic television series, but also feature films. Well, today I wanna to talk through some of the most recent examples that are really pushing these more affordable cameras and bending the rules of what is considered to be high-end filmmaking and reflect on what it all means for filmmakers. One of the most interesting recent examples came out at South by Southwest Festival earlier this month, where Alex Garland spoke about how they used the DJI Ronin 4D on his latest film, Civil War. Garland talks about how Civil War was shot in a very non-traditional way compared to his previous works, which had been using tracks and dollies for controlled camera movements. The film follows a group of journalists during an American Civil War in very unpredictable scenarios. So having a camera that can follow the action easily and compactly without the need for complex track setups like the Ronin 4D makes a lot of sense. So this is a creatively motivated choice as they wanted to put an emphasis on realism, which led them to the 4D's unique feature set. Civil War is A24's most expensive film to date and you can see that a lot of effort has gone into the production design. So being able to help reduce the overall shooting budget by using something as fluid as the 4D for certain scenes does make sense. I'm not talking about the cost of the camera itself, but the cost of the time from setting up more traditional support equipment for every shot. Having a camera that essentially floats in your hand would have allowed Garland and cinematographer Rob Hardy to be more loose and inspired with their compositions and movements as they aren't locked down to a certain camera path or movement. One of the 4D's biggest strengths is how compact and lightweight the system is compared to a more traditional stabilized cinema camera package. You can easily just chuck a strap or easy rig onto it and shoot for hours without anywhere near the same amount of fatigue as you would have with a heavier, more traditional setup. This also means that the camera operator is able to get into much tighter positions and get much closer to their subject, which will be more immersive to the viewer than capturing from further away. The biggest draw of the 4D is the fact that it is a fully integrated cinema camera system inside a stabilized gimbal, with the extra fourth axis stabilization if you want extra smooth shots. This means that you can fine tune the level of stabilization and easily go from smooth movements to controlled handheld shaky cam to full compact handheld mode using their flex system. This is something that cinematographer Rob Hardy noted about the 4D. Having the ability to switch between a handheld look and then more controlled movements for certain scenarios was something they really wanted. The 4D is an incredibly versatile system. This is thanks to how comprehensive DJI's ecosystem of accessories that sit around the 4D are. You can give full control remotely to the camera, gimbal and lens, and still capture great looking imagery in a range of formats, including ProRes RAW. It takes a lot of the boxes that a cinema camera really does require, but of course does have a few limitations that a conventionally designed cinema camera doesn't have when you want to use it in a more traditional way. Civil War isn't the first production to harness the power of the 4D though. On the Japanese feature film Monster, released last year, cinematographer Ryuto Konodo used the 4D alongside the Sony Venice, and cinematographers Sean Carswell and John McGrath used the 4D on the Amazon Prime show James May, Our Man in India. So it does seem that more and more filmmakers are realizing how the 4D could slide into their workflow, as an A camera or as a specialty camera for more run and gun or car rigs, where it really does shine. After watching these productions, it's hard to really tell what is shot on what. The image quality from these cameras really does look to hold up, even when cut with cameras far more expensive than it. The remake of Roadhouse recently came to Amazon Prime, and as you'd expect, the film is incredibly action scene heavy, so it's not too surprising to see red cameras being used. It was shot with a combination of the Red V-Raptor and Komodo, with Lights' M08 lenses. The film is very glossy and overall looks pretty good. The Komodo was a big step for RED as it brought their fantastic R3D internally compressed RAW and IPP2 color pipeline into a very small, lightweight and easy to power body. All these features paired with a great global shutter has allowed filmmakers to capture new shots with a level of quality that would have been far more expensive before. And thanks to it being a more affordable price point, it opened up RED to an entire new demographic of filmmakers who have always aspired to own and shoot RED. I'm sure the Raptor was the A camera on this feature, with the Komodo being employed on some of the more intense action scenes, where a tiny camera with a global shutter would be much easier to mount and put in danger than a Raptor. 
a lot of the film is shot very wide and close, which certainly is a trend with filmmakers currently. But with Roadhouse having so much action being captured quickly, having the benefit to frame wide and capture above 4K with the ability to crop and reframe or even stabilize, while still delivering a true 4K image for streaming, must have been a crucial requirement. It also looks like a lot of the film is captured using some kind of gimbal, which we can see in some of the BTS. This gimbal is very small compared to other options on the market, which in part is thanks to how compact the Komodo and Raptor are. Compare this to something like the Ronin 2, and this package just looks so much more manageable. And for the action scenes, having a lighter camera package would have been very beneficial for longer takes where fatigue could set in with larger packages. There is definitely a difference in image quality between the Komodo and the Raptor, but it's hard to tell what shots are what here. They blend together very well. The Komodo was originally designed as a crash camera to be used alongside other larger cameras, but more and more filmmakers are using it as their primary camera, like us, as it provides an experience close to that of the Raptor at a more affordable price. Roadhouse isn't the first production, surprisingly, that the Komodo has been used on though. There's a pretty long list of different productions using it in some way or another, such as Extraction 2 using it for their 22 minute one cinematographer Zach Mulligan using it on Hustle, and it was also used in conjunction with the Red Monstro on the 2021 film The Suicide Squad by cinematographer Henry Braham. Last year, the internet was taken by storm when Gareth Edwards and cinematographers Greg Fraser and Oren Soffer decided to use the Sony FX3 as the primary A camera for their sci-fi epic, The Creator. The film's overall aesthetic was really interesting, and there's already a bunch of content online about it, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but I have put some links to some great videos and articles in the description if you do want to learn more. As with the other examples we've looked at, the choice to use this camera is motivated by the rest of the production. They needed something small, lightweight and flexible, as lots of the film's production happened out on location, which for a sci-fi film like this is pretty unique. The small crew travelled to 80 different locations to shoot, which is insane. Gareth Edwards is a director that enjoys operating the camera himself from time to time, so the FX3, Ninja 5 and Ronin 3 rig designed for the film was put together to be easy to operate and allow Gareth to move around and frame freely without the need for larger support equipment that would be needed for a much larger camera package. The film is also absolutely full of low-light imagery, and thankfully the FX3 is an excellent low-light camera that's in part thanks to its second base ISO of 12,800. Having this extra sensitivity to play with changes the production requirements for lighting and set design, which will certainly affect the overall budget, feel of the film and crew size. So it's clear again that the decision to use this exact combination of tools was a motivated choice around how the crew wanted to capture the film. It is interesting to see these more affordable cameras being used more and more on these higher end productions, but it's nothing new. We've seen large productions take advantage of the increasing image quality of smaller cameras with regular cinema cameras for years now. But I think these stories are showing that the process of filmmaking is changing. The democratization of filmmaking equipment is going to allow more and more people to tell a story in a more engaging way than what would have been possible in the past. And I think the industry will go a step further in this regard with Unreal Engine in the future too. But that's a topic for another video. So what can we take away from all of this? Well, it really just shows that what's most important isn't what camera or lens you use, everything else that goes into creating a beautiful image or telling a story. And that goes far beyond the tools that you use to capture them. However, understanding your kit and the different tools on the market, how to best use them and push them to their limits is still a crucial skill to have as a creative and a filmmaker. The notion of not worrying about what gear you are using because all cameras are so good now is kind of true, but it's also kind of not. Understanding the tools you use will make you a better creator with these tools. And just like anything else in the world, there are different tools for different jobs. We live in a time where the affordable filmmaking tools available on the market now are better and more affordable than ever before. And this opens up new creative possibilities for not just you, but also the highest end productions. But this can make choosing the right camera for you or a certain production incredibly difficult. There are so many options now, and depending on what you need, the best solution will differ from project to project. If you are a working professional, what camera you buy could simply just come down to what makes the most business sense. The market's demand for a certain camera could make a massive difference. Take the FX6 for example, which has absolutely dominated the UK market since it was released. This will depend on the region you live in and the work that you do, but there are definitely cameras that will get you onto different work that others may not. 
A very common thing said online is that every modern camera can produce a great image. And while for the most part, lots of modern and even slightly older cameras can produce good looking images, how you arrive at those images and how easy it is does differ from camera to camera. The gap in image quality between low and high end cameras is closing. And the compromises you would previously have had to make with more budget cameras are somewhat diminishing. Cameras are becoming much more manageable for solo operators or light crews with less sacrifice to the final output in quality, and high-end image workflows are significantly more accessible now. There are of course still differences in image between an Alexa 35 and an FX3, but the bigger difference is the workflow that sits around them both, because of their user experience, physical size and design, and recordable formats. If you want to talk through what camera could make sense for you, get in contact with our experienced team via the email on screen now. We also have pretty much every video focused camera available on the market available to demo in our beautiful central London or Belgium showrooms. Our technical consultants and sales experts can help you navigate through the endless options out there and tailor the perfect kit and rig for you depending on exactly what you need. Anyway, let us know some of your thoughts down in the comments below. And if you like the video, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.